So I was wondering why it was getting so chilly in here, and then all of a sudden I realized I was teaching polar coordinates. That ah, doesn't get any better than that. So why are we interested in learning double integrals and polar coordinates? We just finished learning double integrals and rectangular coordinates. We did it over rectangular regions. We did it over general regions. Why polar coordinates now? Well, for some, one reason, sometimes the equation of the base can only be written in polar form, or it could be something where the equation in polar form is a whole lot easier to work with than in rectangular form. So think of those cardioids and lemnus gates and all that that you graphed in Calc 2. All of those functions could serve as the base of an object. So we're going to define a polar rectangle. And usually I don't leave all these slides in here, but I thought it was important to show you what a polar rectangle looks like because it doesn't look like one of those 90 degree rectangles. It's defined this way. The R's and the thetas, where the R's, in other words, this is the radius, goes from a constant to another constant. The smallest it can be is zero, but it cannot be negative. That's why there's that extra zero, right? It's a zero less an A less an R less an B. In other words, that radius cannot be negative when we do this. The theta is defined as a value between alpha and beta, right? The theta is the angle, the R is the radius. So what does a polar rectangle look like? There's actually a bunch of different polar rectangles you can look at. The first one is the simplest, where the radius goes from zero to a constant, the angle measure goes, let's say, from 0 to pi over 2. So here you got a quarter circle. Change that pi over 2 to a pi, you've got a semicircle. All right, the second one looks like sort of a baseball diamond almost, where the radius still goes from 0 to some constant value. So both of these start at the origin. This time, the angle goes from alpha to, to beta. So you're not starting right on the axes anymore. You're starting here, right? That's the angle alpha and you're going here to beta. So you're not counting this piece in the middle here, only that region R. The third one looks like the windshield wipers on a car, right? The windshield wipers maybe on the back of your SUV or something, where you're starting the radius at a constant that's not zero and the angle at a constant that's not zero. So you lose this region in the middle. You're still going from constant to constant here and constant to constant there, which is why it's called a rectangle. Those are not functions, those are constants that it's going between. And so those are three examples of what polar rectangles look like. All right, the formula that you use for double integrals has an extra R in it. And if you look through the, the PowerPoint story that I give you, you'll see that when you integrate it, there actually is an extra R that pops out. That's one of the things that sometimes people forget is when you integrate in polar form, you're gonna integrate f of r theta r dr d theta. So you're integrating with respect to the radius first, and then with respect to the angle measure. All right, let's start by looking at a couple of pictures. First off, this says sketch the polar rectangle defined this way. It might be easier if I start with the angle and then work the radius from there. So the angle starts at pi over 4. It's nice. It's halfway through the first quadrant. And it continues until it gets to 5 pi over 4 which is down here. Now, what about the radius? Remember, when you do these polar curves, if you've ever seen a piece of polar graph paper, they're just a bunch of circles. So you got a circle with a radius of 1, and then you got a circle with a radius of 2. And so here's maybe the circle with the radius of 2. Here's the circle with the radius of 3. So make me a circle of radius 2. Now make me a circle of radius 3. So that's going to look a little bit like a rainbow. And this is the region that I'm looking for. All right, so it should now meet all of my criteria. It has a radius between 2 and 3, and the angle measure is between pi over 4 and 5 pi over 4. That's what that polar rectangle looks like. Right? If I had a piece of polar graph paper on this computer, then I could make it a little bit more accurate. Yes, in theory, it should actually be symmetric. Doesn't quite look it, though. Looks like a tunnel, though. All right, what are the advantages of polar coordinates? Suppose you were trying to find the volume of this solid. Z equals 9 minus x squared minus y squared and the xy plane. Now, the projection of that solid on the xy plane is just a circle, right? It's a circle with a radius of 3. But when I go to find my limits of integration, I'm going to end up having to solve this for y. So what will I end up with? y equals plus minus the square root of 9 minus x squared, which I actually wrote down here. Um, not always a terribly easy thing to work with. On the other hand, 
how do you write a circle with a radius of 3 in polar coordinates? Well, instead of having to write x squared plus y squared equals 9, all you have to do r equals 3. That's the equation of the circle. And then you can actually use that equation of a circle and the, the radius in polar form to write this a whole lot more nicely. Let's see how that works. So I gave you a little bit of a reminder. How do you write the equation of a circle? x squared plus y squared equals r squared. Which means then, if I have z equals 9 minus x squared minus y squared, I can take that negative and factor it out. Factor out a negative, and I'm left with x squared plus y squared, right? The negative turns that negative into a positive. Well, that x squared plus y squared, that's r squared. So now my paraboloid, instead of having three terms in it, simply becomes 9 minus r squared. So the inside limits of integration are based on the radius, outside are based on the angle. So let's slide over here and do a little bit of work. The paraboloid had the equation z equals 9 minus r squared. The base is the circle r equals 3. So we've got to set up a double integral. Remember that this is f of r theta r dr d theta. Well, that 9 minus r squared is my f of r theta, right? It says it's z equals, but couldn't I make this not change anything by just calling it f of r theta? Sure. So this piece here is 9 minus r squared times r dr d theta. So now I need limits of integration. We said the base had a radius of 3. So if you picture a circle with a radius of 3, where am I going? I'm starting here where the circle has a radius of 0, and then I'm going in circles and circles of circles and circles of circles all the way till I get to a radius of 3. So my inside limits of integration go from 0 to 3. That circle, in terms of angle measures, goes all the way from 0 to 2 pi. So my outside limits of integration in terms of theta go 0 to 2 pi. Now the rest of it is just integrating. So if I simplify this inside piece here, let's work with just the r's first. I get the integral from 0 to 3, 9r minus r to the third, which will give me a 9r squared over 2 minus r to the fourth over 4 at 3 and at 0. Well, the, the 0 just produces nothing. So I get 9 times 3 squared over 2 minus 3 to the fourth over 4. So if I multiply top and bottom by 2, I get 162 over 4 minus 81 over 4 gives me 81 over 4. All right, now the second part is real easy. Now I need to integrate from 0 to 2 pi of 81 over 4 d theta, which if you see it, go ahead and substitute. If I follow through, I'll get 81 over 4 times theta evaluated at 2 pi and at 0. And you realize now all you're doing is you're taking 81 over 4, multiplying it by 2 pi. Answer is 81 pi over 2. All right, so reevaluating those limits of integration in terms of theta saves me from having to do all of those x's and y's and have square root of 9 minus x squares and everything else. Good, let's try another one. This one is bounded by two paraboloids. So I've got a paraboloid on the top. That's the 27 minus x squared minus 2y squared. That's the top. How about the bottom? There's my bottom. Right, So the bottom is the 2x squared plus y squared. I want to find the volume of the solid that's bounded by those paraboloids. Well, the first thing I want to do is I want to look at the projection on the xy plane, right? Intersection curve projected on the xy plane. How do I do that? Well, they're both z's, right? So let's take the first z and set it equal to the second z. 
So step one, projection on the xy plane. Where is z1 equal to z2? All right. That'll happen when 27 minus x squared minus 2y squared is equal to 2x squared plus y squared. All right. Not so bad. Add an x squared to both sides. Add a 2y squared to both sides. And you get 27 equals 3x squared plus 3y squared. Oh, divide both sides by 3. x squared plus y squared equals 9. That's the base. Is every base in every problem in this section a circle with a radius of 3? No, I just happened to pick two examples that did. So in polar terms, the radius of the base is 3, which means that the r values in my integral will go from 0 to 3. All right, the second thing that I need is I need to find the integral. So I need to set up the integral by doing top minus bottom. So the integrand would be like f of x, y minus g of x, y. Well, that's what I'm doing here. So the top curve we said was the 27 minus x squared minus 2y squared. That's the top. And then the bottom is going to be 2x squared plus y squared. All right, simplify this, see if anything interesting happens. Distribute your negative sign. And that should give me 27 minus 3x squared minus 3y squared. Wait a minute. I've seen something like this before. If I factor out a 3, I should pull out a negative 3. Make it 27, pull out a 3. That'll give me an x squared. Pull out a negative 3 out of the second term. It'll give me a y squared. Well, isn't x squared plus y squared equal to r squared? So the integrand becomes 27 minus 3r squared. And now from here is not bad at all. So step three, set up the double integral f of r theta r dr d theta. So this guy here is my f of r theta. So 27 minus 3r squared r dr d theta. We said the radius went from 0 to 3. And where are the thetas going? 0 to 2 pi. i got to go all the way around the circle to get that shape. All right, keep following through. I'll end up with a 27r minus 3r to the third. Integrate that, I get a 27 r squared over 2 minus 3 r to the fourth over 4. 3 and it's 0. Mm, okay. So I got to do a little fraction work to get this going. I'll do 27 times 9. And here, let's make a common denominator out of this. Multiply top and bottom by 2. And then minus. 3 times 81 over 4. When I calculate that, I don't want to spill the beans, but here's what I get. 243 over 4. The second part of this integral is easy, because now I just have to do the outside. Don't forget to do the outside. 243 over 4 d theta. You realize what happens is you're just taking the 243 over 4, multiplying it by 2 pi. So this gives me 243 pi over 2. So not too bad. Polar coordinates have the advantage that you can get rid of all those x squared plus y squares by doing a little substitution. All right, how about this one? We call this an annular region. If you look in some of the pictures I put in the PowerPoints, you realize that it's a solid on the outside with a hole in the middle. So this is a funky looking integral. How do I do this? Well, what does the base look like first? The base is a radius from 1 to 2, and an angle from 0 to pi. So if this is a radius of 1, radius of 2, 
radius of negative 1, radius of negative 2. Again, my symmetry needs a little help. But there's from 0 to pi. And there's the 2 from 0 to pi. So that's what the base of this thing looks like, right? This thing is the base, and it's all about the base. There you go. All right. What's the advantage of using polar coordinates here? Well, you know that x squared plus y squared is r squared. So I can actually take this x squared plus y squared and replace it with an r squared. The difference here, and I'm just going to set this up, but I'm not going to go through and solve the whole thing because I think you can do that quite well, is that when you integrate this, no more limits of integration for, of 0 for your radius. So we had a couple of problems where the radius went from 0 to 3. Here, if I do this r dr d theta, the radius will go from 1 to 2. The theta will go from 0 to pi, and it's going to be 1 over 1 plus r squared times r. Right, I'll take this one more step for you. I'm integrating from 0 to pi, integrating from 1 to 2 of r over 1 plus r squared dr d theta, u sub. All right, so do a u substitution, make your u the denominator. du will end up being a part of the numerator. Reevaluate your limits of integration. If you want to try it, pause the video, try it, and I'll give you the answer here. All right, so when you get all done, you should end up with a pi over 2 natural log of 5 halves. Not a surprise that the natural log appears in here because that 1 plus r squared in the bottom is the u, and so you're going to end up integrating a 1 over u. All right, let's take a look at a couple of other things. General regions. General regions mean, just like when we integrated general regions in rectangular form, now you're going to be bounded by two curves. So now your radius, instead of being numbers, are going to be functions of theta. So you've got an inside limit of integration and an outside limit of integration. The insides, the r's, are going to go from g of theta, which is this over here, to your h of theta. And then your thetas will have values as well. So two polar curves can intersect and give you a region that looks like that. Let's try an example, set one up, see what it looks like. All right, this is the same thing. All right, so instead of going from a constant to another, you're going to go from a function to a function. I stole this out of the book. I stole this out of some book. Same deal, f of r theta, r dr d theta, except now your limits of integration are going to be functions. All right, let's take a look at the second one on here, which I think is more interesting. I want to express that integral as an iterated integral, so I want limits of integration on it, over the region that goes outside the circle and inside the cardioid. Remember those cardioid, cardioids are those heart-shaped things? So if I'm not entirely sure what these things look like, um, let's do a quick sketch. What does r equals 1 plus cosine theta look like? Well, we know it's a cardioid, so we know it's one of those heart-shaped graphs. Cosine of 0 is 1. 1 plus 1 is 2. So when theta is 0, cosine of theta is 2. All right, so this thing is then, if I put in, let's say, a cosine of pi over 2, I'm going to get 1. And so the cardioid comes like this. Here, I got my loop for my heart here. I got the other half of my heart over here. Look at that. I even did it in red ink for a heart. All right, the other thing that is bounded by is a circle with a radius of a half. So here's a circle with a radius of a half. We know it's going to fall inside here, inside here, inside here, but probably outside there. All right, so that is my circle with the radius of a half. Now, specifically, what area are we trying to find? Outside the circle and inside the cardioid. So outside the circle, inside the cardioid is over here, right? Outside the circle, inside the cardioid. First of all, where do these things intersect? Let's set them equal to each other to find intersection points. Where does 1 plus the cosine of theta 
equal a half. Well, that'll happen when the cosine of theta is negative one half. Go back to your unit circle. That happens at two pi over three and four pi over three. But now, what area am I actually trying to find? First of all, this is the outside region. That's the inside region. So when I go to subtract them, I'm going to want to do outside on the top, inside on the bottom. But if I want to capture all this area here, I can't go from 2 pi over 3 to 4 pi over 3, right? 2 pi over 3 is out here. 4 pi over 3 is down there. That's just the part that I don't want. So I want to capture the part on the inside there, and I want it to be continuous. So in order to do that, I'm going to start here at negative 2 pi over 3. And I'm going to work my way around. So I'm going to be here at negative 2 pi over 3, and I'm going to work my way around until I get to positive 2 pi over 3. Right, going this way around the circle so that the area is continuous. So here's what it looks like. The inside we said went from a half to 1 plus cosine of theta. We said the angle measures went from negative 2 pi over 3 to positive 2 pi over 3. And I don't know what my surface is. I was never given a surface. So f of r theta r dr d theta. And that's how I set it up. The only other thing you'll find in this section if you go through the notes is that it actually is possible to use this same formula to find the area inside of two polar coordinates, which you did in Calc 2 using just standard old Calc 2 methods, but you can actually apply that formula to find area between two polar curves doing this same way, where instead of integrating a surface, you're basically integrating one. So you're integrating one r dr d theta lower. And so I could actually do the same thing here, right? If I wanted to find that area that I outlined in green over here, then I could find that area by setting up this exact same integral as one times r dr d theta, limits of integration remaining the same, would give me the area between the two polar curves. All right? That's the end of this section.